Welcome to MyPersonalFootballCoach.com's Soccer Player Development Podcast. Discover all the secrets, hints and tips about soccer player development and soccer coaching from some of the leading figures in world soccer. Here's your host, Saul Isaacson Hurst. So, Joe Antonelli, welcome to the show. Thanks, Saul. Thank you for having me. Uh, can you give us a brief sort of uh, description of your playing and coaching background up to this point, mate? Yeah, of course. Um, the, the playing part of it will be pretty brief. <laughs> I think the highlight of my, my playing is uh, probably winning a local futsal league recently, but, um, but that's as far as it goes. So, no, I was never attached to a club. Um, always sort of played, obviously, for local clubs and, and county level, um, but was never in a, a part of an academy. Um, always loved football from a, from a very young age um, and got into coaching fairly young. Yeah, I did my, my level one uh, when I left school at 16 uh, in that summer um, with a view to kind of just getting any experience I could really. Um, I was always keen to to dip my toes into coaching. Um, so, yeah, I did my level one at 16. Uh, started coaching at, at 17 in a, in a local company um, in terms of school coaching and, and after school clubs, Saturday mornings. Um, and then I uh, had an opportunity to uh, join Chelsea in the foundation department when I was, I think, uh, 19 years old. Um, so I was there for, I think, three years um, before I got an opportunity to to go to Barnet FC and work in the academy there. Um, so I did that and I was there for, I think, uh, four years at Barnet before heading into my next role, which was at Fulham. Uh, and I was there for another four years um, before going to where I currently work, which is Crystal Palace in the academy there. So that's and, the full journey. And how, long been at, how long have you been at Palace? I've been at Palace for five years now. Um, it was five years in February, just gone, yeah. Wow. So you did four years at Fulham, four years at Barnet as well? That's correct, yeah. Wow. And so what did you do at Barnet? Uh, so Barnet, um, as I say, was my first sort of uh, experience at coaching within an academy. Um, and I was the under nines assistant, uh, was yeah. my first role. Um, which I enjoyed. Um, it was good to, to get a little look into that environment. Um, I was working with a good friend of mine now. I'm still in contact with Adam Lewis. Um, and then I, uh, I, was, I think I was one season there as the assistant and then I took over the, the lead coach for the under-9s the following season. Lisa, and just briefly, what, what was your role at Fulham? Just so we can just have a bit of context quickly. Yeah, to, to Fulham, um, I went initially to coach with the under-12s and then I spent three consecutive seasons coaching them under 11s. It's interesting. So good way. So you've had quite a career already. How old are you, Joe? Don't mind me asking. I'm just doing the maths, but I'm crap. So <laughs> I'm 32 now. 32. Cool. So let's just because just, just, like I say, you went into coaching quite young. Um, tell us about those. Tell us, well, let's talk about Chelsea then, because Chelsea, we don't often talk about foundation. That's a massive club. What was that like? You know, we, when I was at Chelsea, there was, there was just there was just the beginnings of the link between the academy and the foundation they just tried to make a real positive sort of they I think they identified you know you got all these troops on the ground and all this talent in there because obviously I started to work at the foundation at Tottenham that's why I got my break in the academy I was lucky they had created that link tell us a bit about your first experience working at Chelsea in that club and the foundation for that massive you know brand yeah yeah no of course it was um it, it like you say it is a, it is a massive brand Chelsea foundation um it's a huge program I was fortunate enough to, to work out of Cobham, um, so in the Surrey area. So when I was in the office, I was I was in Cobham, obviously in the in the same building as, as the academy guys. Opportunity to to coach, you know, in different schools on different programs. Um, there were some evening sessions, invitational ones. Um, you know, we coached anything from from kind of nurseries all the way up until sort of you know under 17s groups that were visiting from other countries and uh, you know that along with some opportunities to, to go abroad as well and, and coach internationally so yeah huge program um a really good kind of first coaching role for myself because it allowed me to coach across various age groups with, with boys and girls of, of different abilities so 
yeah, it's an experience I look back on and got fond memories of it, to be honest. Do you think that's? Do you think those 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 hours spent on the grass with the different age groups and different abilities and all those sort of things? Do you think that helped you in your you know your later career? Yeah, as I say, I, I look back on it now and um, having to find you know find ways and, and be creative and find ways to to relate to these different types of children was was massive. Um, no week was the same. Every day to day was different. You know, you you'd be going from from an after school club, like I say, to um, to a sort of development centre session, or you know, a breakfast club in the morning with with year ones um, with learning difficulties and jumping straight back into a different session. So, kept you on your toes. Um, in terms of communication, it was massive having to communicate in different ways and 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 learn how to to show real empathy for for the kids. And I think that was a, a massive. Um, point in my career which which you know I had to learn that which was good what about stuff like session design and stuff I remember my time you know working in foundation you'd go you've got to do like a after the school or lunchtime you've got 30 kids and two footballs and things like this or you know that you know what's what are the sort of challenges in that and how you know how creative did you have to be in times of session design and you know and keeping the kids you know entertained yeah I think that's that's a key point because like you say I think you never knew what what you were going to have in terms of your numbers or you know you, you arrive and, and your co-coach has, has only got half of the equipment because he's had to give it to somebody else and you kind of had to go to sessions with um with an idea but with an idea plus a sub idea or, or, or a second and third idea because just in case you know the numbers weren't right or as I say you don't have the correct equipment so yeah, it forced me to be be creative as a coach, and you know I'm sure you've got lots of listeners who, who coached um, in foundations or, or within schools, and yeah, you have to you have to be on your toes, as I say, to have different things in the lockout for when you need them. Yeah, I suppose it's like sink or swim, isn't it? You sort of got to deal with it, or you know can't stand the heat, get out of the kitchen. You know, with yeah, those that's it. Twenty twenty five five year olds screaming at you. Yeah, and don't get me wrong, I've, I've probably had some 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 bad sessions put on and, and things that didn't look great at the time but you know I guess that's all part of being a young coach and and being thrown in at the deep end with with 35 year olds so so yeah when did when did you decide or when did you think yeah actually I want to work in academy football that's for me I want to try and step and take the next step into the elite sort of game yeah I think it was um probably when I was at Chelsea Foundation um as I say we were we were really lucky to work in the same building as as where the academy were based um but probably fair to say in, in my time there there, there was no um there wasn't a strong link between the foundation and the academy um i think there is now um i think they've got you know designated staff like you say so i think they realized that you know they had hands on the ground and they were in a lot of schools so i think those links have, have been created now but but yeah i was always keen to um to sort of go on to an, another level and eventually obviously do my coaching courses. And I was eager to, to test myself and to, and to learn, um, you know, a different way of coaching and to work with, with more elite players. I was always keen to do that. Tell us then about that Barnet gig you got, the nines assistant. How did that come about? And tell us about the process and your first sort of, you know, the first thing you noticed when you went into the, to the building on the pitch. Yeah, I was, um, I was invited to, to, to go down initially and just do just do some voluntary work initially it was um a friend of mine at the time uh, uh, James who, who used to work in the academy at Chelsea actually he was the academy manager there um so he moved from from Chelsea to to manage the academy at Barnet um who I knew who, who'd coached me previously um and he, he knew that I was keen to to you know have a look at the environment the academy environment so he invited me down um it was it was voluntary initially and you know I was living in South London actually and, and traveling up to um to northwest London um you know two or three times a week to, to just to get that experience so it, it was challenging I'd be driving from South London or from from Surrey from my foundation work to to get there for, for six o'clock and then and then get home at 10 o'clock at night but yeah I loved it um as I say it, it gave me a little insight as to to what it might look like and you know the structure of it and, and coaching within uh, a curriculum or or a syllabus um and obviously the level of player was was pretty good as well although it was only a cat three program um i was quite impressed with with the level of coaching and, and the level of player there 
tell us about them. You, you know, you're you're there. You watch the first few sessions. What are the first, you know, your main things you you know reflect on, thinking, wow, you know, those sessions were. Tell us what sort of sessions were they, and what was you know special about them. What were unique? I think um, from from looking at um, what it looked like with the under nines, I was very impressed with. Um, you know, we, we did a lot of technical work, um, ball each, and the sort of the, the number of touches and, and the um, the speed of, of which everything was being done by the boys was brilliant. And I was, I really enjoyed it. Um, the, the boys enjoyed it as well, you know, having the ball at their feet and <clears throat> going through, you know, high repetition, um, technical practices. And, and I could obviously see the benefit of that. And, and the boys were, were of a good technical level. Um, and I think it made me curious. I think I, I watched it and I thought, oh, wow, OK, um, these boys are at a good level. You know, what have they been doing? What kind of training have they been doing to to get to this level? And, and as I say, it made me curious to, to try and watch not just that group, but other groups as well and, and just learn more about the academy environment as a whole. You, you talked about the technical stuff, one ball each and stuff. Tell us what else, what, what, what else, you know, tell us what practically were, the, were they delivering at Barnet at the time? Yeah, so they were... I've got to say, I think the programme was, um, it had a lot of links to, I believe, what Chelsea may have been doing at the time. Um, as I say, because our, our academy manager had just come from a few years working at Chelsea. So, yeah, we had a lot of technical practice, um, followed by some, you know, a lot of small-sided games, especially in the foundation phase and, and overload practices and a, and a big emphasis on um, on the technical side of it, but also on decision-making. You know, um, you know, do I share, do I go on my own, sort of 1v1 into 2v2s and a lot of um, wave practices up to sort of 4v4, 5v5. So we did a lot of that within the foundation phase um, and nothing really went over 4v4, 5v5. Um, I think Saturday, the game format for those guys in, in the under nines was obviously 6v6. Um, so we, we, we touch on a little bit of 6v6 stuff on a Saturday uh, before the game, but but primarily it was all smaller numbers, um, as I say, sort of ball mastery and, and 1v1s, 2v2s, overload wave practices. So tell us a bit, you progressed to head, head a coach of the nines. Tell us about then, you know, you're delivering these sessions. So tell us, I mean, I'm, I'm always interested, in, you know, to think about, you know, session design, you know, you're drawing your sessions, you're doing your planning. Where do you come up with the ideas for this? Do you know what I mean? Are you looking, are you drawing on what you just, the experiences you've seen in the academy or are you looking externally? Mm. I think I think for myself, I was obviously, you know, at most clubs you have sort of a best practice library or, or practices that you can draw upon to use. But, you know, and I, I, I realised quite quickly that I really enjoyed um, composing and, and trying to make up my own practices. Um, and, and I still try to do that to this day. So, you know, when you'd put something down on paper. So when you know that sometimes it looks brilliant on paper and it doesn't work out. Um, but I was always keen to, you know, especially with the younger guys, to weekly you know, I was conscious of giving variety to them as well. I think, you know, there's a case for repeat practice. And if a practice is brilliant and it's given what the players need, then great. But, you know, at that younger age, I was always trying to give them variety. So, yeah, I used to I used to enjoy, you know, in the small spare time I had, um, getting the notepad out and, and trying to think of new ideas based on things that I'd already done or things that I'd seen from, from other coaches. So, yeah, and I think, you know, as you deliver uh, week by week, month to month, season to season, you you realise what works and what doesn't. Um, but I think that's really key in terms of, you know, your own coach development is is putting lots of stuff down on paper and and trying to uh, to try new things, yeah. What was what the main challenges being a head, you know, the head coach of the Nines your first season or two? You know, what the main problems? I mean, you know, I'll give you a clue here. What begins with P ends with errants, maybe, but... <laughs> <laughs> but no, that no, was one of the challenges. But tell us a bit, but some of those, 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 those things you had to deal with. Yeah, I think that's that's probably one of the, the things um, that you encounter first from from from, from an assistant coach to, to one, one second. One, Joe, one minute, one minute. Yeah, I think obviously the probably the, the key thing and the, and the bigger ch biggest change from going to from an assistant to, to a lead coach was 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 dealing with parents. Um, Obviously, there's, there was a small sort of admin side to everything, probably not as much as there is now with, with the introduction of the EPPP and, and things like that. But yeah, the, you know, having to liaise with the parents, having to communicate, having to having to deal with emotion as well, because, you know, especially at the under nines age, it's, it's their first, um, it's their first year in, in academy football. So, you know, so the parents don't necessarily know exactly 
you know, what the environment looks like and, and what kind of problems they might encounter. So I think, you know, having to work with them and, and, and educate them, but educate them in a way where, you know, it, as a football parent, not as a parent. And I think that's key. And that's something that, you know, I still try to do to this day is, is understand that they are, you know, their children and no one knows their children better than them, but being in an academy and, and trying to support their, their son or their daughter the, the best way possible is something that we might know about and, and have to edu educate them. So yeah, it was challenging at times, but I, I'm sure it is at every single club across the country. So it's about your next move, then you go to get to go back down towards your own manor, again down that neck of the woods, uh, down at Fulham. Unbelievable academy, by the way, Fulham, like, you know, in terms of the players they're producing, you know, top, top academy. Tell us about that, how did that come about and what your initial experiences? Yeah, the, um, like I said, I think it was um, three and a half years at Barnet. Um, I, I ended up with, I was coaching the 14s and, and leading the YDP in my, in my last role there, which was, you know, I think I was 21, 22 at the time. So that was that was a really good role, um, really insightful. Um, good, good for me being so young and, and having that sort of responsibility. But I think it, um, it, it got to a stage where I was sort of unsure as as to or happy about the, what I was learning and was I watching enough coaches and you know was it time to try and go to a new environment? So. Yeah, I was, I was approached for a role um, by Fulham. Uh, I had a friend, good friend of mine, Ashley Thomas, who, who was working there at the time. And, uh, he, you know, I, I was speaking with Jeff Noonan and, and Kevin Betsy, who were there at the time. Um, yeah, so I went in there for, for an interview um, for a position to uh, assist with the under-12s um, there. So great club. Uh, I, was, I was really impressed with, by, with everything that they did the moment that I went in there. Um, for an interview um, and the interview went well uh, and yes so I, I decided to, to take the role um, after some consideration obviously I was full-time at Barnet you know and I, I decided to, to take a part-time role at Fulham um, for a couple of different reasons I think the main one was an opportunity to learn and I think that was key um, you know yes it was it was a pay cut and, and I knew I'd have to seek additional work to, to go alongside it to to make a living um, but I was still relatively young and I was living at home and, and it was the perfect opportunity for me to do that um, and I took the role at Fulham um, first without without finding that other work um, sort of hoping that I could pick up other bits of coaching and I just saw it as a big learning opportunity not just um, obviously with Fulham and to be part of an excellent Cat, Cat One Academy but as I say to knowing that I'd also have to find other coaching jobs and and Obviously, that they'd be different to what I'd done before, and I could pack a lot of different experiences into into my week, which, which I ended up doing, and, and yeah, obviously made me a better coach in, in the long run because of it. So, so just quick, just briefly, you, you started as under twelves coach, and what other roles did you do there before you left? Just quickly, just yeah, yeah, I was under twelves, and then I'd, I finished. Uh, I was with under elevens uh, as the lead coach for three years before I departed. Right, cool, interesting. So let's talk about that. Then, what what were the initial you know, because Fulham, big club, you know, um, amazing academy, like I said, great track record. What are the initial things you you saw? What are the differences between that you know, and Barnet, basically, was you went in there? Yeah, I think um, the first thing was was probably the, the volume of staff um, and, and sort of staff across different departments. You know, the multidisciplinary um, team at Fulham was, was, was huge in comparison to perhaps there wasn't one at Barnet. Um, I think obviously at Barnet where there were really low staff levels and I actually, during my time there, was the only coach at an age group for a few months at a time as well. Um, so it was challenging, but at the same time, it, it forced me to, you know, to think outside the box when I, when I didn't have that support staff. So, if, you know, if I wanted to do some analysis or some clips, you know, I had to source the footage, film it and, and, and clip things myself and, and then deliver that to the players and, even in terms of recruitment back at Barnet, um, you know, there were very few scouts and, you know, the, the academy manager, if there was a Sunday gap in the games programme for us, we, we'd be out in Regent's Park and, mm -hmm. and scout. So, yeah, it was, um, we used to do a lot there. And obviously when I went to Fulham, it was, oh, okay, you know, there's a mass amount of scouts here, you know, the recruitment department takes, takes care of itself. You know, we've, we've got your conditioning and performance movement coaches. You know, we've got um, our sports psych team. We've got assistant coaches. You've got 
cover coaches that are you know covering across two groups and there's just a a whole different level of staff there which which was really good to have with you because you know you could tap into all sorts of different staff for you know for advice and support on on what you're delivering to the boys so uh, that would be the you, first thing you you mentioned it as well they it's about learning because obviously you mentioned Jeff Newton who also now works the FA Jeff unbelievable like a unbelievable someone I, I, you know, I'm lucky to call a friend I've talked to him a lot he's like a top top player developer the experience and Kevin Betsy obviously I've worked at Arsenal another top that's one of the big things isn't it when you're lucky enough to work at one of these big clubs is just this, the, the you know the volume of top player educators and the, the environment to go in there you can't help but learn because you're just seeing you know world-class practitioners every day I mean how how important was that how, how impactful was that on you and you know what's what's sort of, what are the initial sort of things that you take away from that in that environment yeah, no, that's that's the that's the exactly it. So I think um, even when you're you know you're not working directly with somebody you know of that of that ilk, you can you know you'd be walking through ready for your session on, on an evening or a weekend, and you just glance an eye over and watch a fantastic coach just deliver a fifteen minute practice, and you pick something up, and then you you know you jot it down when you have got five minutes. So yeah, I, I agree with you there. But it was brilliant to to sit and, and those they're great people as well at Fulham. Um, you know, you could always knock on somebody's door or make a phone call and say, you know, can I come down and watch? Can I come down and, and deliver 10 minutes? And the answer was always yes. And that that was, you know, invaluable for, for a coach to be able to do that and, and coach with different people. So, yeah, I think something that, you know, probably the first thing that I learned there from working with, with some really good coaches was um, the importance of individualising the programme. I think at Barnet, um, our delivery was very good and we had a great syllabus it was really detailed but there was a big focus I found especially in the YDP during my time there was was a focus on the team um, and the tactical element of you know we're four three three, and this is how we're going to play and when I went to Fulham it was you know it's player first and the individual you know is at the forefront of everything we do so you know how we develop our sessions and design our practices is is focused around developing the individual. So that was, that was probably one of the key things I, I saw during my time. Give us, so give us an example of that. So every academy says, you know, we're about the individual. And obviously, you know, as you know, a lot of them just go and try and win the game or whatever. But so tell us how, how, how does that look in terms of your practice design? And how does you, how do you, how do you, as an individual program, you know, transfer onto the pitch with their players? It gives an idea of the sort of stuff you're working on and how, what's, your, what's in your thought process thinking right about, you know, how do you, because it's difficult, isn't it? As you know, you know, you're coaching a team, you know, just had really focusing on those individuals. Yeah, I think, um, you know, the, obviously the guys, you know, and this is probably the same for all clubs, obviously have their, their IDP, their individual development plan. And, you know, and we, and we did have that at Barnet, um, but I, th I sometimes felt at Barnet it was there and it was ticking the box for E-Triple-P, um, but were we put, actually putting it into practice, um, you know, in the sessions and games? But I think Fulham was, the way that, that we did it there was, was really good. I think, as I say, there was always individual targets given to players during sessions, um, first and foremost. So, you know, it could be a practice around uh, create and finish. Um, and within that, um, one of the one of the wide players may have a target of you know deliveries off off your second touch, and that, and that was a target for him based around his IDP. So you know it could have been in a small number format, and he was getting a lot of repetition, but he knew that that was the technique he was working on within that practice. And I think something else that um, was very good was the structure of the week was set up. So you know on a Wednesday, the first hour of the session was strictly based on IDP and that was not just a technical theme you know everyone had their IDP everyone would arrive at say five o'clock the first hour um, whatever that player needed he went and did a session with with the relevant staff so for example you know a boy may have needed some extra technical repetition he'd go out on the pitch there'd be some technical circuit stuff set up and he'd do that if a boy needed extra gym work he, he would go into the gym because he needed some movement or, you know, if a boy needed some, some help around, uh, you know, resilience or confidence, he, he'd do a little bit in the classroom first so he could take that out onto the pitch. And it was, it was really about giving the players exactly what they needed during that extra little hour rather than just, you know, a generic uh, IDP session where everyone's working on technical, you know, when you, you could have had a, a, a real masterclass technician in the group that needed something else. So, that was something that, that they did really well. 
tell us about then to become 11's head coach tell us a bit about then a general what is the pro what is was the program there did you have like a technical cycle tactical cycle how did you you know arrange your work uh, your week in terms of like your planning your sessions and that sort of thing yeah i think it was um it was a nice blend of, of sort of tactical and, and technical but I think when I was working with the 11s and 12s, there was still a massive emphasis on, on technical development and and decision making. I think those those were the two key two key parts to it. Um, as you say, so there were some really really talented boys at, at the academy, um, and, and that was another thing I think I always had to think about was okay, I've designed my practice, but I've got some exceptional boys here. So what have I got in my pocket that I can draw upon as a progression or? as something different to challenge the boys because the likelihood is you know you'd, you'd set the practice up and, and they'd nail it pretty quickly and I know you, you've worked at some good clubs and you, you've seen that as well so I think having having things you know in the locker to pull out on draw on um, and progressions was key and I, and I always try to you know have those ready with me when I was planning the sessions I think a typical session would, would probably look like um, a lot of sort of ball mastery or technical work initially. Um, probably nothing, nothing majorly new in terms of the way the session would look. Um, so as I say, sort of a, a real technical focus early on, but always opposed. I think something that the, the club were big on were, were at the time I was there anyway, were, were to try and have technical practices in an opposed scenario. Um, you know, and I, I think it's something that all people are looking at now and, and thinking, you know, is, should it be just unopposed or does it have to be opposed? And I actually think at the time we sometimes went a little bit too far the other way in terms of, you know, it has to be opposed and there's, there's no place for technical unopposed repetition. But so, so give us an example of that then, that's not like ball master you're doing opposed. Yeah, I think it was, you know, if it was ball master, it'd always be um, a skill move, but immediately into a 1v1. Um, I think it was, you know, there was a few times where I'd, I'd do a passing and receiving practice, working on different types of receiving or different types of passes. And it, 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 it was really short. It was a really short period of time. I actually remember I'd done it a couple of times and someone would say, hey, you know, you've got to make it a pose now. Um, that, you know, that happened. Um, and I don't mind sharing that. Um, you know, I, I, I don't think there's, you know, it's black or white. I don't think there's a right or wrong answer, you know, and as I've, as I've had different experiences at other clubs, I think it's a continuum, and you, you need to you need to have both within your you know your weekly setup. I think boys, yeah, it's just about it's about it's about balance, isn't it? And it's about and the issue obviously when you're doing a pose is the volume, is it? Are you going to get the volume contact yeah. time and the the directed target volume? But you know, like I said, if you know, it's always room for everything, isn't there? Yeah, I think yeah, like you say, it's a, it's a balance, and I think especially at sort of nines to twelves, you have to think of. You want the boys to experiment still. You want the boys to try something new that they might have not done before. But if it's, I always thought if it's a constant opposed environment, they're probably more focused on doing the one trick or the one skill move that they know in order to, to beat them hand and get success. When really you still need right. that experimental stage of, okay, I've got a ball at my feet. Let me, and I've got, I'm going to do sort of 10 moves. Let me try four I already know and six that I don't. And, and I think that's where, you know, you talk about skill development and that's where that creativeness comes from. So, yeah. That's a test. So you do your ball master warm up, then what would be next? Yeah, it'd often be um, kind of a, a directional cut or possession-based um, practice. Um, it could be linked to theme as well. So, you know, a, a, a possession practice with with conditions or, you know, an overloaded or underloaded practice um, looking at sort of problem solving, but always with goals as well. You know, something that we always focused on was making sure we had goals, you know, involved in the practice in, in some respect, whether they were on the ends of the pitch or, or in the middle or on the sides, but an opportunity for, for boys to, to score goals. That was something that we were always, um, I remember focusing on at Fulham was, you know, are there goals? Because, you know, football's about scoring goals and we need to make sure that the boys are getting enough repetition on, on getting their shots off. So that was something that we always tried to incorporate as well. And um, how did you come up with it? Was it like, a, did you have like a tactical cycle or something like that? Was I mean, what was it? How did you know what you're going to coach? Were you reacting for the game? Or was it like, you know, did you do, you know, in possession, out possession, plan out from the back, that sort of thing? What was the... Yeah, we, we followed a theme. Um, we had a we had a tactical um, theme. You know, we followed something. Um, the five moments of the game, which 
don't ask me to name because it's been a few years now, but <laughs> it, 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 they were in and out of possession um, topics uh, and transitions and, and restarts as well. But re, restarts were something we, we didn't really focus on until sort of later on in the YDP. But but yeah, you know, you, you, you moments of the game and, and you're playing out from the back, controlling and creating and finishing um, as well as sort of looking, looking to press or looking to screen and cover. Um, so yeah, there, there was always a, a tactical theme that, we, that we'd go with. Um, but as I say, in the 11s and 12s, it was, you know, it was less of stop, stand still and, and more of kind of small sided games, problem solving and how can we deliver um, those themes based around those, um, that structure of, of practice. Yeah, interesting. So let's just talk about then your, your move to your current club. How did that come about? Tell us about that process. Sorry, so I lost you there. So just tell us about then your current club, the move to, to Palace. How did that come about? Uh, yeah, so I think um, I, I knew um, Gary, the academy director at Crystal Palace um, previously. Um, I, was, I was approached by them quite a few years earlier, actually, when I was at Barnet. Um, nothing materialised. So, you know, I, I knew a few people within the club um, and I was, I was contacted by them during my time at Fulham uh, as they had a role available which at the time was the 13s coach. Um, it was a dual role to coach the 13s, but also to manage the, the games and tour programme at the academy. Um, yeah, so it was a different kind of role um, and one that I was a little bit unsure of um, at the time. But, you know, in, in my mind, again, was I was, I was part-time at Fulham, um, as I say, and I was, I was coaching within the academy and I, I had sort of, another three or four coaching jobs on the side uh, of that at the time, um, which was busy, um, you know, seven days a week. And I was keen to, to try and get back into a full-time position if possible. And, you know, they're not always easy to come by, but also keen, as I said previously, to, to go into another environment and learn again. Um, and, I, and I did feel that my, my best work was, was done in the YDP. Um, so it was something that I was talking with Fulham around um, and sort of waiting for, for the right role to come up there um, to work back in the YDP phase. Um, and, and I was approached by Crystal Palace um, uh, and, I, and I had good chats with Fulham. As I say, the people there are fantastic and I was very open with, with what I'd been approached with um, by Crystal Palace. And uh, and I decided to go. Um, I decided to, to take the role after, after sort of three or four years at Fulham. Um, yeah, but it was good because, I, you know, from going from a primarily category three program at Barnet to, to a category one and then an opportunity to go maybe sort of in the middle um, to, to a category two program, um, but a good club, a, a good academy, but a developing academy and, and geographically it was probably a little bit better for me as well I was still living in South London and you know I'd been putting some serious miles on the car so I needed to <laughs> I needed to think about that as well so yeah I decided to go. So it's about then you know your initial experiences when you get into the club at another top academy unbelievable track record producing players unbelievable like catchment area so I always think about Palace just that you know that raw talent everywhere coming in through the door like you know talk, tell us a bit about your initial experiences there yeah it was um it was a really good experience um it was again like i say a different environment i think one thing that was what i noticed was challenging at the time there um it, it didn't when i when i went five years ago it didn't look like it did now um the facilities were, were a struggle we were, we were based around um three training sites and you know for anyone who's been to to the old Crystal Palace sites over the years it's um yeah a challenge because we you know we used to be based in an office in, in Beckenham um but then have to travel of an evening off site to you know Crystal Palace National Sports Centre or you know the, the academy used Bromley FC as well so there was there was multiple sites which was challenging um for, for us as staff but also for the players too you know traveling from site to site so you know, we'd often be training on, you know, half a sort of three quarter pitch with another age group as well. So, yeah, you know, it presented certain challenges, but challenges that I could reflect and look back on my time at Barnet and, and understand them that, you know, it's, you don't, it's not always bells and whistles and it's not always, you know, you don't always have everything you need right there and then. So, yeah, that, that the facilities was probably the, the first challenge, but in terms of 
player ability, I, I was really, really impressed, actually. Um, all age groups when I got there and, I, you know, I'd spend, try and commit as much time as I could out watching other groups. And uh, I was actually blown away by some of the, the quality um, that, that I'd see uh, there. I, I actually didn't expect it. So, you know, very, very good players. And like you say, some real good raw ability, fantastic catchment area. Um, South London, uh, especially where we were. So yeah, level of play was was very very good. That's about the what the what was the curriculum like in terms of when you get in there? What's, what was the 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 uh, philosophy of the academy, the methodology compared to you know your other clubs? Yeah, and I, um, I ended up working with the under 11s actually in my first season. Um, the the curriculum was good. Um, it was a real nice blend of um, technical and tactical, but. We also something that was also really good was we had a, a really good futsal program that we had as well, which was um, something that I was impressed with straight away and something that I actually helped to develop um, during my first couple of months there. We used to on a Wednesday we used to do an hour sort of pitch based outside and then we used to go inside and, and play futsal in in the hall. Um, sort of you know tournament kind of vibes it was really good it was really quick it was really competitive and I, and, I, and I think it was you know the guys now you know they're so busy with academy football and school and uh, and I think they the boys have lost the opportunity to just go out and play on the street and play you know big numbers small numbers uh, cage football um, and it's something that you know in South London as you know is massive but our boys being in an academy they don't necessarily get the time and I think it was something that the boys loved. Um, it was very much, okay, here's the teams, here's the tournament structure. Futsal rules primarily as well, which was good. And it taught them, uh, you know, a different sport. So but the technical returns and, and the psych returns actually were massive. Um, and the boys probably now in our, you know, in our youth team went through that process for, for two or three years as well. And it, it was a really good uh, programme, I've got to say. Let's tell us about those tech, tech and psychological, you know, outcomes you're getting in that, in that environment, that foot cell environment. Mm. I mean, look, obviously, ball contact was massive. Um, it's very, very quick. A uh, lot of opportunities to play 1v1 in tight spaces and, and develop your skills. But in, in terms of the psych, um, yeah, the, the, the coaches, we were really sort of clever with... Um, how we set the teams up and, and little challenges and, and just little chats that we've had with the player. It was really, because we used to do like a, I think it was a monthly league table. Um, so we used to then do the scores, you know, the points every night and then we'd feed back to, to the groups via the parents. And so they'd come to sort of week four of the tournament absolutely buzzing, knowing that they've got to get three wins to get to the top of the league. And, and yeah, the coaches were very tactical about, you know, what we did on the touchline, it, it very much be, okay, um, you know, one boy's, you know, he needs to develop his, his resilience or the ability to deal with a little setback. So it'd be right. He'd go and go. Um, the coaches would grab him and say, listen, I want you to take a few risks with the ball at your feet, travel out, look to get shots off. And then we counteract that. And then we talk to another lad and say, listen, he's coming off his line, get, get the ball and chip him. <laughs> try, and, try and finish him because he, he's taking the mick. He's trying to come out. And there was a lot of that sort of counteracting um coaching of, of individuals and yeah it, it was it was really good to watch um you know we, we, we film it sometimes as well and we share it with the other staff and and uh, yeah it was good to watch and we look back on it now and we we feel it's a really key part of our program you know both technic tactically technically and like I say across the sort of site corner as well it was really good so, so interesting so let's tell us now about like you're now your lead coach for 14s and 15s uh, tell us about that firstly why why is that why is it done that way as of 14 to 15 and then um, and then tell us obviously now the academy's gone through some huge changes obviously recently the whole club tell us a little bit about the environment now yeah I think um, I think that in terms of my role now with the, with the under 14s um, the club has this season um, just implemented it actually in terms of the two year two year age band so I think it's it's happening in the foundation phase as well um, to to stay with the group just for not just for one but for two seasons and go up with them. So I'll stay with the same same group for next season too. I think it's it, we discussed it as a whole group um, and everyone sort of gave their opinion on it. Um, I think well 
we'll wait and see. But I, I always think that sometimes, you know, it takes a few months to build the relationships with the players. You know, forget the football. You have to get to know the players first and they're all different. And, you know, at our club, it's quite a big group as well. Um, and I know that's a common theme across, you know, most of the Cat Ones at the moment, sort of big numbers. So I always thought that, you know, our best work as, as coaches was delivered um, in the second half of the season. And then before you know it, it's, it's April, May, and then the season's coming to an end. So I think it'll be good because, you know, we'll go into next season um, with a really solid relationship with the players, um, knowing how they learn best, uh, you know, knowing what they need on a weekly basis. And I think we can hit the ground running in, in season two. So hopefully that, that process is, is going to be a good one. Um, yeah, there, there's been a lot of changes. The facility. Tell us, about, tell, tell, tell us about then. Just, I mean, I'll interrupt, so let me because I'm, I'm nosy and I wouldn't know all the all the details. What's what's your typical week then for the 14s then now, for example, now because cap you've gone to cap one as you say, big investment, amazing facility now, world class facility. Tell us about a typical week for the 14s. Yeah, so the 14s, um, it's a busy one. Um, it's, they're they're really busy. I think that it's four or five days a week. So a normal week for for the 14s would be. Tuesday, the boys are, not all of them, but the majority of them are part of our hybrid programme. So the boys will have a, a half day at school and join the academy for two o'clock on a Tuesday and Thursday. So a typical Tuesday at the moment for, for our under-14s will be arrival at two o'clock. They'll have, from 2.30 until 3.30, they'll have um, an IDP session, which will be very much you know linked around there development targets um, in, in small groups of sort of four or five players. At 3.30, they'll, they'll finish that session and then they'll, they'll go in for some food and then they'll, they'll go straight into the classroom um, from four until five and they'll be in there with their tutors to, to do their schoolwork on, on whatever subjects they're, they're doing, um, which is really good because the numbers and the ratios are, are, are good. You know, they sort of one to eight ratio in the, in those classrooms to, to do that hour of school work. So, yeah, no, it's really good. And they'll have a small break and then they'll train again in the evening from five until 6.30 out on the pitch. And then they'll go into the gym and they'll, they'll do some stuff in the gym for 40 minutes. And then we have a, a small analysis slot as well from 7.30 till eight o'clock and the boys will stay till eight. So really long day, um, a Tuesday and a Thursday. I think the analysis session is a good one, but it's also one where we have to be clever with the way that we're delivering because it's 7.30 and I've, I've always found that if we're in there for half an hour making the boys watch video, how much are we really mm. getting out of it? So we've had to be really clever with the way that we deliver that and we've tried to mix it up as best we can. So so that would be a Tuesday. Uh, a Wednesday uh, would just, Wednesday evening session um, would only be for players who are part of that hybrid programme. You know, because some some boys may not be able to get out of their school to, to join that. So a Wednesday evening session will be made up of um, any trialists we've currently you know have in, also boys that aren't in the hybrid. And that session would look like very much how the IDP session would look like for the boys on the hybrid on the Tuesday. Uh, and then they'd, they'd have some gym and mobility work after that. Uh, Thursday is the same as a Tuesday um, in terms of the, the all day from two o'clock. And then we still train on a... Saturday morning for 90 minutes and, and a game on a Sunday. Wow. And then tell us a bit about then your like your week as a, as a coach. What, what's that like? And obviously now, you know, working in that, that environment full time, what, what are the challenges? What's sort of the planning process is? How, how, how do you have to deal with the multidisciplinary sort of aspect of the club now? Yeah, I think, um, as you say, there's, there's, you know, our, our staff numbers are, are much bigger now and We've got a brilliant sort of multidisciplinary team and, and things that are available to the players. Um, I think at our club, we, we meet once a week. Um, we meet on a, on a Tuesday. To, we, have a, we go through the, the list of each squad from sort of 13s up to 16s. And we designate um, four players a week um, to discuss every Tuesday on an MDT meeting. So, you know, staff around the table would, would obviously be the, the coaching staff. You know, lead phase, um, medical, um, sports psych, player care um, and, and education. So, you know, for example, four boys from, from my squad, we'd, we'd sit down and, and we'd discuss, you know, any issues around, you know, it could be football, could be education, 
around those players. So, you know, everyone's, every player is discussed within that meeting sort of once every, every six weeks. Yeah. And, and tell us about the, you know, the, the curriculum or the, you know, the, the, the coaching methodology now in terms of the, what, how do you, do you have a te- technical, tactical cycle? How do you decide what you're delivering each day or night? Yeah, we have, um, we have our, our game model, which we work from, which is our, our syllabus. So it's, uh, we, we work across kind of two week cycles in terms of our, our tactical element that, that we're going to focus on. We, we, we work off our six moments of the game. Which, which is pretty much, you know, very, very similar to what you might see from kind of the FA model. It's, you know, pitch into thirds. We look at in possession, um, building or, or playing out from the back, middle third, uh, looking at our control and create. And then the top third, our, our create and finish. And then out of possession, uh, we've got our three moments of the game, which are, you know, defending in a high press, which is primarily how we, we, we'd like our teams to defend, but also then defending in the middle third and, and defending the penalty box. So that, that's our kind of six moments of the game that, that we base off. And we'd only, we'd only look at um, each third for two weeks. So if I, if I take an example at the moment, we're looking at the middle third. So we our two week block of work, we'll have a focus on control and creating possession, but also defending in the middle third. So, each coach in each age group has, you know, uh, can can deliver that how they see how they see best. And I know that some coaches in week one will only focus in possession, and then in week two they'll go. So week one control and create. Week two defending in the middle third. How we've delivered it in the full teams this year is is to deliver both over two weeks. So it'd be myself might be looking at the control and create element, but. You know, my co-coach would be looking at the out possession stuff. So there'll be a practice that would be being delivered. My sole focus will be in possession. His will be out. And we'd continue that for the whole week um, into the game day as well. And we'd, deli- we'd coach on a game day in and out of possession as well. Um, it's worked OK. Um, it's not to say that if I'm looking at in possession, you know, I can't help individuals with out possession. We, we still can. But I think the boys kind of know... Um, which coach is looking at, at what moment as well. And, and it's, it's worked quite well at the moment. And, you know, like I say, two weeks for, for each part and then we go to, to another part. So we'd look at, you know, after two weeks focusing on, on this, these topics now, we'd then go into the, the final third, for example, and look at create and finish or defending the penalty box. How do you manage that with your co-coach then? I assume is he part-time, the co-coach? Is your, your assistant? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Co- uh, everyone, everyone to call it. So how, how do you... What are the challenges in that in terms of man- managing them in terms of what they're doing? And because obviously it can be quite it can be quite difficult. You're in all day in the mornings, maybe they come for after the work, you say it could be driving from God knows where. How do you manage that relationship and what are the challenges and sort of things around that? Yeah, obviously it can be challenging. Yeah, he's he's, he's part-time. Um, but he's 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 fantastic, my assistant Mark. He, he he dedicates a lot of time to the role, even even though he is part-time. Um I think it's obviously all about just identifying a, a good window in the week. And, and you know, we, we're used to it now. We've been together for sort of 18 months. So um, I know the right time and to message him about the weekly structure. And, you know, it's, it's, it's about me dropping him a message at the right time and say, look, this is what the week will look like. This, these are the parts that I'll deliver. You know, I'll go in position, you go out. And we, we settle into a nice kind of routine. So... And I think we, I mean, we still use the PMA um, for uh, for anyone that knows it. it. It can be a pain, but it's also, we, we, we see it as quite a good cheering tool because obviously when we design our practices, we, we'll put it on there immediately. So so Mark will will design his practice for Thursday night uh, and he'll upload it onto there and we don't necessarily have to talk about it. You know, once he's done it, I can go onto the PMA and look at it and then we can have a discussion once we see each other in the building. So um that's kind of the way we work um it, it works really well for us um but yeah we, we, we do find the pma useful probably one of the only few people in the country that actually find it useful still but... yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Not, not many people have a kind word to say about the pma normally it's uh, you know just uh <laughs> dog ass, you know daggers yeah. um, um so and, and tell us about like give us an idea of a typical session might look like in terms of like you know this is you know what sort of things you're putting on and you know, I guess it's the same sort of stuff you're doing at Fulham. There's nothing, you know, or, you know, to people, you know, coaches, you know, want to know what sort of drills or sessions you're putting on. Yeah, yeah. For, for, for us, a sort of typical um, 
like I say, obviously the boys are in all day on Tuesday and Thursday, but the, the, the session that the, the guys will do on their hybrid is very low intensity. We're obviously we're conscious of the, the workload and, and what we're asking them to do. So I think the IVP sessions, as I say, are, are quite relaxed. Um, we, we try to use a lot of video in that as well. Um, so for example, we, we might have somebody working on, you know, wide play in terms of uh, skill move and, and crossing. And we'll, we'll have the iPad out on the pitch and we'll be, you know, we're looking at um, someone from the weekend. So, you know, example, we've got some, uh, a lad at the moment who's looking to just improve his aerial control from wide areas. So um, we'll be watching clips of Mares, who's like ridiculous, his first touch at the moment. And so we'd, we'd get the iPad out and we'd watch him and, and then he'd go and he'd do a few balls and it's quite relaxed. We talk about his technique and, and you know, what's working for him and what's not. Um, so that's what you know the hybrid session would look like in terms of the evening um, pretty much the same week by week um, we, we, we do what's called uh, brilliant basics so the first 15 minutes after um, their kind of pitch based movement warm up is always brilliant basics which is a technical focus Each it will change weekly so this week it's, it's dribbling to beat an opponent um, it could be you know passing variations it could be receiving under pressure it's a it's a technical theme and and we call it brilliant basics so um, that's what we deliver for the first 15 minutes it, it, it might be opposed like like we spoke about earlier it, it could be opposed it could be unopposed and, and you know I'll tend to lead it one day and, and Mark tends to lead it the other day and I think if we're opposed the first one we'll, we'll go unopposed the second one and, and we'll try to keep it fresh in that respect um, and then and yeah and then we'd kind of drift into um, a, a game model focus really um, that wouldn't necessarily be in an 11 v 11 format I think you know we, we don't want to go Tuesday tactical you know game prep session straight away I think the way that we've done it in the 14s would on a Tuesday, it'd be a, an introduction to, to objectives. So, okay, boys, this is what we're working on. This is what we want to get out of the week as a whole. This first session today will be two smaller groups, two groups of eight, uh, eight with one coach, eight with the other, and with introduction to an objective based around a 6v4 or 4v4 or, or something in small numbers. Um, and then we would uh, we'd swap, so you know both sets of players would would get a little bit in and out of possession. Um, and then on a Tuesday we'd go into um, something more small sided, whether it be a kind of three team game. Um, we've got a really good um, three team game that we play, and the boys absolutely buzz with it. So we we do that, or we do kind of um, four team format, four v fours on a Tuesday. Um, and then on a Thursday something very similar, but we we drift into more. After our brilliant basics, we go into more of a slightly larger number focus um, on on the objective. So it'd be you know kind of more eight v eight, nine v nine stuff, um, bigger distances, more more game realistic distances. Um, yeah, uh, sort of possession based stuff, or as I say, just just game based stuff with conditions. Something that looks more like more like the game, if you like, in inverted commas. Um, and then our Saturday session is is. It's quite a traditional session, really. Um, I think we we have we sort of do some some team rondo stuff on a Saturday, um, and then we sort of drift into into some more game prep. But the, the way that we do it in the full teams is we off, we probably give individual targets within a game. So based around two things: the boys' IDPs, but also you know the game model objectives for the week, and we we distribute a, a target that they can focus on on a Saturday, and then take into the game on Sunday as well which we, we found quite beneficial. And tell us about the game on Sunday and how do you approach it in terms of what formations you play? How do you balance the winning plus development? Obviously, you're a little bit closer there to the performance phase. What's, what's, your, you know, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think for us, it's, it's, um, it's about performance always. Um, I think there's, a, there's, a, there's naturally a bit of a, a winning mentality at the club, if I'm honest, which is really good to see. I think our boys are really competitive. I think even small things in the programme, like you know the futsal programme we discussed earlier is through the foundation phases, really allowed them, the boys really want to win. And, and, but it's brilliant because it, it, it does come from them. It doesn't come from us as staff. Um, the boys hate losing, uh, which, which I really enjoy to watch because it, it, it makes them play and train with real intensity, which is good to see. Um, 
I think the, the games for us uh, it's good. Obviously, our games program is really good. We we play, you know, as you know, so the, the, the London clubs. It's every week's a good game. Um, you know, we're playing Arsenal, or we're playing Tottenham, Chelsea, Fulham, Brighton. You know, there's some fantastic academies out there at the moment, and every Sunday's a, a really good fixture. So um, I think. Some, something that we spoke about our club is are the boys getting enough games? Um, is the volume of games enough? I think we've I think we've played around fifty games this season, which is okay. But we've, we now we've got a better facility as well. We're looking to increase the the number of games that the boys are playing um, to try and get a, an extra one in midweek if we can as well. Um, how did how would you do that with like your hybrids and also then the Wednesday program because the boys are split? How would you, how would you how would you manage that? Yeah, it's challenging. I think for us, we've, we've got quite large squads um, at the moment as well. So I think that second game is crucial because, you know, we want to get everybody playing, you know, minimum 60 a week. So which which can be a challenge, as, as you probably know. But I think it's just trying to be creative with it as well. And How many you know, players have you got in the group? Uh, we, we had... Uh, we had 20 players this season um so yeah fairly large um so i think yeah it's just getting that extra game time is quite important so i think we've we've done a few sort of mixed games as well you know we might do a mix 13s 14s game we might do mix 14s 15s game i mean third, like tomorrow night for example we, we're doing a an in-house game 2007s versus 2008s and we're, we're trying to be be creative with with the different types of games that they're getting internally as well so um yeah, no, we're, we're always trying to think about different ways to get more games. What about Palace Brighton? Big old local derby. Just, what's they called that? The M22 derby or something? Yeah, the uh, Gatwick derby or something like that. Yeah, yeah. What's um, <laughs> any any ban- any banter with that? I mean, any uh, you know, is there any any bit of banter with the other coaches? I mean, did the parents get into it? I mean, what's it like? I mean, you know. You know, we all talk about local derbies there. Was it just another game? Oh, yeah, I, I've got to be honest. I think it's just another game. Um, <laughs> it's uh, obviously the first, like, I, I went to the first team game, like, this season, Palace Brighton. I, I, it was, like, incredible. Like, they really don't like each other. And I, I'm just, you know, they're miles away. But it is a big rivalry. But when we when we play Brighton, it's, um, it's another game. Uh, mm. You know, like, it, don't get me wrong. It is, it's, um, it is a good game and it, it is a battle and... They are great games because they've got some really good players coming through Brighton as well. So I really enjoy the games there. But it very much just looks like the other games. It's the same when we, yeah. when we play Arsenal or we play Tottenham and, and Chelsea. So it's, um, as I said, that I think we're really lucky in London because the games programme is brilliant. And what they've done, obviously, the Premier League with the cup competitions as well has been really good. I think those games are are key for the boys' development. You know, there's something riding on it and it gives the boys an opportunity to to get a feel for that playing for points because, um, you know, hopefully one day that's that's where they'll be. So I think those, those, those have been really good. Um, for us, it's the Albert feeling. Obviously, you've got the Floodlit Cup as well um, for the mm. 15. So, um, yeah, that, that, that's been really good, those cup games, because the boys have missed out on, obviously, tours due to COVID. Um, which, which I think are brilliant as well. Going, going abroad and, and playing against you know different clubs and, and having a look at how how they do it on the continent. So yeah, those cup games have been fantastic as well. What about yourself? What was your own ambitions in the game? You had an unbelievable career already. You worked at some top clubs, and you know what, what's where, where you know what's 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 next down the road for you? Obviously not immediately, but you know where would you like to go? First team level, you know, academy manager. What, what's your you know if you have ambitions like that already? I think um, no, I wouldn't say I've got any immediate ambitions to to, to be an academy manager or, or even go to first team at the moment. I'm very content with with, with what I'm doing, um, working within sort of the YDP, and I've got some ambitions to to go to the top of the YDP and potentially um, in and around the youth team. Um, but that's probably as far as it, it's going for now. Obviously, in in the long future, uh, if any first team positions presented themselves then possibly but right now I just want to become the best sort of youth development coach I can still learn as much as I can and and, and do courses and, and do various different bits and bobs to to become the best that I can be um, at what I'm doing um, you know I'm a believer in that rather than sort of trying to jump really quickly up the ladder which which you sometimes see I think it's just crucial to become the best at what you do first um, 
it's a similar thing with the players. Obviously, we have those discussions. You know, I've, I've got talks with players at the moment about, oh, you know, why am I not up with, with, with the 15s and I want to go there and 16s and, you know, I haven't been on an England camp yet and why, why not and what have I got to do? And I just think that just, you know, focus on your training now and your week to week and, and being the best at on your job because that's your job and, and everything else will, will follow and take care of itself as long as you're, you're doing well. So, yeah, yeah, very much uh, from that viewpoint at the minute. What, what would your advice be for a young aspiring coach, you know, coming coming up in the game, wants to have a, a career like you? Bearing in mind, you know, it's pretty much, you know, thinking about those opportunities you've had all came through networking or your network of, you know, people throughout the game. What's your, you know, advice for young? Because I've always got to ask a question, I want to work in academy football, you know, what's the best way to get into it? I think, like, first and foremost, it's, yeah, go out and experience different types of coaching, um, I think obviously you can go straight into an academy and that's fantastic, but <clears throat> the academy is a very unique environment and it's very, it is very different to what it looks like in the parks and, and within the schools. And so the first thing is just experience new, new things and go out and coach as many different age groups, different genders that, you know, at different levels that you can, because I think that's, you know, that's what gives you the strings to your bow and, gives you different uh, attributes and different ways to communicate. Um, yeah, different experiences, really. I think that's that's the key thing, um, to go out and develop different experiences. I also think that sometimes you have to sort of take a step back as well. Um, obviously, within your sessions, that's great because you can get a different viewpoint on things, but just generally just to take a step back and go, okay, where am I at? What am I good at? What do I need to get better at? you know because there's a bit of a rat race sometimes and things move really quickly and you, you, you're caught up in your day-to-day -day. so sometimes it's good good to take a step back um i think another thing is is patience as well and you know it's, it's really good to be ambitious and it's something that i've had to get i think i'm quite ambitious but i think i've had to improve my understanding of you know it's not easy and it, it, it's a long road and sometimes you have to be patient and and understand that you, you're going to get setbacks and you're not going to go to exactly where you want to be and within a year or two years and you have to enjoy the journey and um, you know be open to different experiences and um, yeah, so long if you're going to coach in football it's a long journey I've had, I was having this conversation actually with um, uh, my partner's cousin uh, recently and just sort of saying to him that it's brilliant and it's a fantastic career if you can do it and if you love football there's nothing better and you know I don't see it as a job. It's something that, you know, I love doing. It's a hobby, but it is a long journey as well. So don't be too too impatient and just just enjoy the journey. Yeah, that's, that's something that I think about. Joe yeah, Antonelli, thanks, mate. It's been top. Appreciate it. No problem, sir. Thanks very much. Thanks for tuning in to the MyPersonalFootballCoach.com Soccer Player Development Podcast. MyPersonalFootballCoach.com's Dynamic Ball Mastery Program is the world's leading online individual technical training program, proven and developed at the highest level in the English Premier League. Sign up now to train like the pros and take your game to the next level. Master the ball, master the game. <laughs>